Thank you very much. And I was there we go. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. I'm not sure what it is right now, but. <laughs> 1993, I graduated Tufts University, came back to Kuwait, and a man had just been fired from his job because of his religion. And to make matters worse, the guys that fired him gave out leaflets to the local community apologizing that had he known this guy's religion, he wouldn't have hired him to begin with. And I thought, my God, what planet did I just land on? I wrote about it in the press, but who's going to read a 22-year-old's op-ed? And I wrote and illustrated my first book, which I intended for adults, and so I was both confused, insulted, and happy when I got an award for children's literature based on it. <laughs> The book was called To Bounce or Not To Bounce. It was about a land called Bouncy Land, where everybody was around. In that society, they judged you based on two values, how high you bounce and how fast you roll. That was it. Main character is born as a half circle, can't do either. He's ostracized. They make fun of him at school. He tries to change himself, doesn't work. At the end, though, there's a flood. The round swans can't control themselves, but he's now a boat, and he saves them one by one and forces society to reevaluate the importance of diversity. Book does well, award from UNESCO. Book two comes out a year later but a land called Rainbow Land, where they judge you according to the color of your bow tie and where it is on the rainbow. So red is better than orange, better than yellow, all the way down to violet, the worst place in society. And they have marriage laws, as any good society might. If you have a red bow tie, you can't marry anybody the blue ribbon, because what does red and, red and blue give you? Purple, last place on the rainbow. Right? And you ask them why they live their life in that way, so they point up to the sky, to the rainbow, and say it's the natural order of things. And then he points at the inverse of the rainbow and the river, and shows them what's on top is now on the bottom. That book did well. My third book got banned, and I quit writing at the age of 27. <laughs> Went to graduate school, did my doctorate in clinical psychology, trained at Bellevue Hospital in the Survivors of Political Torture Program. Because I speak Arabic, my patients came out of Syrian prisons and Iraqi prisons. People have been tortured for all kinds of things, including religion, tribe, uh, ethnicity, so on and so forth. Did that for a couple of years, took a break, it was pretty intense, applied to business school. And right before I went to business school, 9-11 happens, and I find myself at a crossroads. I've been one of these people that always complained about how Islam is being represented in the media, was great at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the arguments as why it should be otherwise, but really hadn't done anything. And so it was a do or die moment for me. What was I going to do about this? As, as the father of five young boys, I become very, very worried about who their role models were going to be. Every time something terrible happened in the name of my religion, the religion becomes the average of what just happened and, and, and what was there before. And our leaders come out and say, that's not Islam when something terrible happens. The problem is there's nobody stepping into that space. My story of the 99 starts with a cigarette. I don't smoke, although I've tried. It hurts me. Um, but, I, but it starts with a cigarette, because when we had our first child, my wife sent me to this place to get these herbs that women in Kuwait take when they give birth, called hilba. It's a traditional thing. So I went, and the guy who was selling the hilba had a plastic bag, had a cigarette going to the two, two fingers, and through the same two fingers, he had a spoon. And as he's scooping up the herb, you don't know how much of it is burnt tobacco and how much of it is the herb he's putting in the bag. And I thought to my wife, like, you're not taking this. Of course, I lost that argument. But in business school, I started developing a plan. What if I did this in a very Western branded way and created a market, did all this research for the Islamic market? And that was on my mind. But then it's, it's 2003 when I'm in business school. The US invades Iraq. And I have a business plan for raising money for a plant in a war zone. It didn't make sense. So I'm 32 years old. I'm in a cab in London going from Edgware Road to Harrods, which I refer to as a pilgrimage every Kuwaiti makes once a summer. <laughs> and in that cab ride, my sister turned to me and said, you know, said to me, you, know, you told me after school you'd go back to writing and I'd illustrate. And I thought, you know, I didn't intend to write for kids to begin with. So I said to her, I said, you know, Samad, for me to go back now, it's got to be something that has the reach of Pokemon. Otherwise, it just doesn't make sense. That wasn't me saying I could do Pokemon. That was me saying, shut up. But my mom was there, so I couldn't say shut up. <laughs> so she understood, and I started to free associate it, as any New York trained psychologist would. I said, I said Pokemon. My next thought was there had been a fatwa against Pokemon. It's actually not allowed in some Arab countries. My next thought was, my God, what's happened to Islam? And who's making these random decisions for my children? My next thought was of Allah or God, and how disappointed he must be. My next thought was that Allah had 99 attributes. And ironically, it brought me full circle back to Pokemon, which has over 1,000 attributes. And that was the aha moment for me. So I developed my pitch, went to my investors, and I said this. I said, if you look at the superheroes that exist in the world today, this is 10 years ago now, they're all based on Judeo-Christian archetypes coming out of North America. Like the prophets, all the superheroes are missing parents. Superman's parents die in Krypton. Batman's parents die when he's six. Spider-Man is raised by his aunt and uncle. And all of them, like the prophets, have a message delivered from above to a messenger. The prophets get it from God through Gabriel. But Peter Parker's taking that photograph, and the spider descends from above and gives him his message through a bite. Superman's parents send him to new parents in a pod, very much like Moses' parents sent him on the Nile. And then you hear the voice of his father saying to Earth, I have sent to you my only son. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And I told my investors, the reason for this is because there's a Western conspiracy. I'm kidding, you can relax now. <laughs> the reason for this, the Bible is known as the greatest story ever told. The stories work. And so modern, modern day storytellers build it on an older architecture. And my pitch to them, the only people using our, our, our culture has been the bad guys. Let me get in there, lift some storylines, secularize them, and create what became the 99. Now I'm going to tell you how this happened, but, it was, but I'm, going to, I'm going to warn you. My mind is a little bit like Hotel California. Okay, you can check out anytime you like, but you won't be able to leave. Okay, so it's, so it's 2003, Baghdad had just fallen. But according to history, Baghdad had fallen several times. One of, one of the times was during, in 1258, the Mongols invade Baghdad, they destroyed all the books from Dar al-Hikmah library, were thrown in the Tigris River, and the Tigris changes color with ink. It's a story passed on generation after generation. I rewrote that story. In my version, the librarians were able to save all that culture and civilization in the books by dipping the stones into the river along with an alchemical solution. And so all that knowledge was not, was not lost. Those books are then smuggled into, uh, through, Andal through Arabia into Andalusia and Spain, where they're safe for 200 years. But in 1492, two important things happen. The first is the fall of Grenada. The second is Columbus gets lost and finds this place. Right? <laughs> so now going back to my stories, 33 of the stones are smuggled onto the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, and are spread in the New World. 33 go on the Silk Road to China, South Asia, and Southeast Asia, and 33 are spread between Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. And now it's 2012, and we have 99 heroes from 99 different countries. So the, these are some of the characters. The characters, it never matters. In the world of the 99, it doesn't matter what religion you have. We don't discuss religion. It doesn't matter what country you're from. It doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl. If you're a girl, it doesn't matter if you're covered or not. All that matters is the power you have, and can it help us solve the problem that we have at hand today? They work in teams of three to solve their problems. And this is how they are able to manage the conflict. So it's not about, you know, he's a boy, she's a girl, or you know, he's Muslim, she's, she's Christian. It's more about, he got to use his power. How come I didn't get to use mine? That's how they navigate tolerance and intolerance. It's in a very neutral way. Central to the concept is this newer stones that I created. Basically, these stones have the power in them. Now, there's an important thing to recognize here, and this is one of the ways that I capture what happens in the Muslim world, is that they, these stones all have a self-updating mechanism in them. The main bad guy doesn't want the stones to update. He wants to leave the information in them in the 15th century. By so doing, he can control knowledge and therefore control the characters. And in fact, when he convinces some of them in the beginning that he's the good guy, he makes them all wear the same cookie-cutter gray uniform. And when some of them realize that's not the way to go and switch over to the other side, each one of them has a uniform that's actually expressed by their individual stone, yet they're part of a group. When we first hit scale, it was very, very lucky. I uh, wish I could take credit, aside from being a pescary person, I really can't take credit. I, I cornered a New York Times journalist in Dubai early December 2005. I didn't have a product yet. The book, first book was coming out 2006. I cornered him. And I, and I pitched him, and I think I scared him, because he, he, he said he'd write about us one day if I just kind of left him alone. And, and, and he said, you know, Islam and cartoon is not a timely story. So I said, OK. So I come up in a month. I said, Happy New Year. He said, thanks. We had a baby. I said, congratulations, like I care. Um, when, <laughs> when's the article coming out? He said, Naif, Islam and cartoon is not timely. So I give up. And a week later, the world erupts in the Danish cartoon controversy. Islam and cartoon became timely. The New York Times started emailing me. Right? They, and the next thing I know, they do a full page in the Sunday Times on January 22nd, 2006, which changes my life forever. Because anybody Googling Islam in comics, guess what they got? They got me. Right? Which led to unbelievable positive coverage to what we're doing. And, we, and from that, we were able to raise a second round of financing. This time was not much needed. Because during that whole time, more and more people knew about us. And so with, the more people know about you, the more problems you encounter. The first problems we had were in Saudi, where I got banned, and then unbanned, and then rebanned, and then kind of banned. Right? It was a very confusing time. But the way I dealt with that is I raised money through an Islamic investment bank in Saudi called Unicorn. Now, Unicorn came in. They have a Sharia board that supervises their investments to make sure that they're kosher in terms of Islamic stuff. I didn't have to change anything. But it opened up the doors in Saudi, and then the windows came closing down on our fingers in America. And I'll talk to you more about that in a second. Fun story about this. So I have five boys. They love what I do, superheroes. I mean, so Faisal, who was seven, six at the time, or seven, I was on the phone. Unicorn says this. Unicorn said that. I don't know. I'm going to talk to Unicorn later. He came up. He said, Baba. I said, what? He said, you talk to unicorns, too? <laughs> So after getting that financing, we were able to, to spread word. We were able to sell licenses. The 99 comic books we were able to sell in 12 different languages, Turkish, Arabic, Chinese on mobile phones. The 99 Village theme park opened in Kuwait four years ago. It's not Disneyland, but we have 350,000 visitors a year, which is, which is more than 10% of our population. But the thing I'm proudest of is the TV series, which is launched, which launched on global television. But before I talk to you more about that, I'd love you to see a clip. This is true. 
truly a gift I have given you. It's a curse. The newer stones? Your stone is one of 99. Each bestows a powerful gift upon its bearer. We call Noaf Jabbar the Powerful. And my Norse stone makes me Nora, the light. So, who am I? You are Dog, the Afflicted. That means I hurt people. Ah! We try to use our different powers to do good in the world. To help people. Your Norse stone has given you a great deal, but if you continue to misuse it, you'll only attract people who'll exploit you. It's pretty clear. I'm part of something bigger. A new family, maybe. The 99. I am. So the, the, the full clip is up on YouTube, but in the interest of time. So we, we, sold, we sold the TV series globally. The first place that bought it was America. It was the hub, a joint venture between Discovery and Hasbro, which is unheard of for a fledgling company, let alone one that's all the way in Kuwait, which is a big, big coup for us, has sold it since the Cartoon Network in Asia. Various broadcasters already come out in most of the world. Um, and from there, we were able to do something that, for the first time in 20 years, DC Comics allowed, which is a crossover with their characters. So in these books that came out in America, some of them have sold out, Batman, Superman, and a Wonder Woman who found her clothes after 70 years of rummaging in the closet. <laughs> um, Work together. The storylines start off with distrust. In fact, in book two, Superman punches one of my characters. And then they find out that it's the bad guys from both universes causing the distrust. And they move over to trust. So classic social psychology type experiment done in comic book form. This was a big coup for us. This series had a lot of promoters and a lot of detractors. But first, I want you to hear it directly from one of its fans. Over the past year, the United States has been reaching out and listening. We've joined interfaith dialogues and held town halls roundtables and listening sessions with thousands of people around the world, including many of you. And like so many people, you've extended your hand in return, each in your own way, as entrepreneurs and educators, as leaders of faith and of science. I have to say, perhaps the most innovative response was from Dr. Naif Al-Mutawa of Kuwait, who joins us here tonight. Where is uh, Dr. Mutawa? Right here. His, uh, his comic books have captured the imagination of so many young people with super, superheroes who embody the teachings and tolerance of Islam. After my speech in Cairo, he had a similar idea. So in his comic books, Superman and Batman reached out to their Muslim counterparts. <laughs> and I hear they're making progress, too. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks. So, so we're on top of the world. Our characters show up, we hang out with Batman and Superman, even help Modern Woman find her, find her clothes. We sell, our, we sell to a major US broadcaster. The president of the free world talks about your, what could go wrong? Well, we got a fatwa from Fox News. Obama's Muslim and this proves it. He's trying to brainwash your kids using Sharia superheroes. Anybody watching the show will become radicalized and become a jihadi, my favorite was we can't let those Muslims brainwash our children like the Mexicans did with Dora the Explorer. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Wired Magazine put out this cartoon to commemorate, commemorate our, the, basically the censorship of the 99 in America, because what happened is our broadcaster got spooked for fear of losing advertised revenues, started delaying the show of the 99 for two and a half years a year. They own the rights, and they won't do anything about it. This is how the 99 started on the back of a Howard Johnson's placemat back in Manhattan. Uh, the idea there was for a new Muslim Archie. I met the owners of Archie. I said to them, they're both 70-year-old New Yorkers. I said, I have an idea for a Muslim Archie. And one of them got very nervous. I said, Muslim Archie, how would that work? I said, well, for 65 years, Archie's been trying to choose between Betty and Veronica. <laughs> I say, marry both and move on to new storylines. And his jaw drops on my own. 
this is where we are now. We, we've created almost 1,000 jobs on four continents and taken this from an idea in a cap to $40 million in financing and to the global stage. But this has not been easy. It's been ups and downs. One of the, you know, we, financing is always an issue. I cornered uh, the CEO of a large private equity company in, in, uh, at Davos a couple of years ago who had turned me down in 04, he turned me down in 07. I went up to him and I said, Adif, I said, I heard you came here on a private airplane. Is it true? He said, yes, why? I said, this may be inappropriate, but can I fly back with you? He said, you don't live in Dubai. I said, I live in Kuwait. It's an hour away. I'll figure it out. He said, OK, come. So I had him in his team for eight hours. They had nowhere to go without a parachute, and I pitched them. <laughs> and they end up financing us. So basically, I wanted to just leave you with a final thought. Um, Time is up, but there is good news. Uh, are the online rights that the, our broadcasters have been sitting on came back to us November 17th, and on December 1st, the 99 did launch in America on Netflix. So if you have it on Netflix, if you have Netflix, please add us to the queue and please let me know what you think. Thank you. Thank you.